This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid out somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Good evening. This is Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And these are the evening services, uh, or the PM services, for Sunday, June the 27th. We'll be singing four songs from Songs of Faith and Praise. We will be observing the Lord's Supper. And I have a message for you that I hope will be beneficial. So if you would please, if you have your hymn books uh, with you, if you would turn, please, to number 490, 490. It is well with my soul. Or sometimes I've seen the title of this song, When Peace Like a River. We will only sing the first verse. 490. <clears throat> when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well. With my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well. Number 477. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. 477. We'll sing all three verses. 477. <clears throat> there is a place of quiet rest. Near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest. Near to the heart of God, of oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer. Sent from the heart of God. Hold fast who wait before thee. Near to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet. Near to the heart of God, a place where we our Savior meet. Near to the heart of God, oh Jesus, bless me. God, a place, a place 
place where Where all all is joy and peace. Near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer. Sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee. prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Uh, Let's turn to number 335. We'll sing verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2. In memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast. Where every humble, contrite heart is made a welcome guest. By faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are fed. The cup in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we're told that Christians gathered on the first day of the week to break bread. We come to understand that verse is talking about the breaking of bread that is we, what we refer to as the Lord's Supper, sometimes referred to as communion. It's an interesting communion, isn't it? I like the word. Um, It is a very, very personal communion that we have with God. Uh, It's it's kind of uh, multifaceted because we have a personal uh, tie to God, and so there's a vertical uh, relationship, yet we usually partake of the Lord's Supper with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we feel the love of each other as we are sharing and remembering uh, what happened on that uh, fateful day when Jesus was nailed to the cross and he gave up his life for each one of us. Um, uh, it is just wonderful to hearken back to that. It's so wonderful to think that uh, God uh, loved us so much that he sent uh, his son uh, to take the form of a human being, to feel everything that human beings feel, to be tempted as human beings are tempted, uh, and to eventually uh, die for the remission of our sins. So as we gather about the Lord's table, let's hearken back to that day 2,000 years ago when Jesus gave up his life that you and I might live. Let's pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was uh, willing to have his body tortured uh, on the cross. Uh, The pain that he must have gone through is unimaginable. But the glorious thing is that he did it for each one of us. And in that case, we, we must take it very, very personal that Jesus died for me, that Jesus died for you, that he gave up his body that we might live. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember that and help us uh, to uh, understand the magnitude of that sacrifice. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.
Blood is that life-giving liquid that flows through our body that does many, many wonderful things while it's flowing. Um, and um, it is the essence of humans, that blood flowing through our body that takes things all through our bodies. And um, we understand that uh, blood was, has always been important. Uh, blood sacrifices were done in the Old Covenant because of the importance of that blood. And Jesus uh, fulfilled that once and for all. Uh, sacrifices no longer had to be made because Jesus shed his innocent blood that we might live. And so as we partake of the fruit of the vine, let's remember the blood that Jesus shed, the blood that washes away our sins. Let's pray. We just give you thanks, dear God, for uh, your willingness to allow Jesus to die that terrible death and the blood that flowed from his head, from his hands and his feet and from his side. Uh, in that, we are reminded that he was willing to give up that uh, life-giving liquid that uh, we might have forgiveness of our sins. As we partake of the cup, let's hearken back to that and realize the forgiveness that is within the blood of Jesus. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Usually about the same time that we partake of the Lord's Supper, we include our weekly uh, giving. Uh, it's not part of the Lord's Supper yet. There is so much about it that relates back to the Lord's Supper. It is the chance that we have to give back just as Jesus gave on that fateful day. Uh, even though it's not physically related, there is a relationship, isn't there? We get the opportunity to give back. Help us to give back with gratitude. Help us to give back with charity. Uh, help us to give back with the knowledge that all that we have comes from you. Let's pray. We just thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that not only uh, that we have the opportunity to give, but we have the disposition to give, that we have the desire to give. And help us to be cheerful in our giving, knowing that these gifts will be used for the furtherance of your work in, in this part of the United States and maybe even in places abroad. Bless us as we give and help us to understand that all that we have comes from you. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song we'll sing before the lesson is number 479. 479. We'll sing the first three verses. The first three verses of 479. Peace, perfect peace in this dark world of sin. The blood Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace, by thronging duties press to do the will of Jesus. Jesus, this is rest. Peace, perfect peace, with sorrow surging round. On 
and Jesus bosom not but calm is found. That concludes our song service. Thank you for participating with us. And I know that the Lord is glorified as we uh, sing praises to him. If you were there this morning, you uh, learned that uh, the lesson uh, this Sunday evening is the recipe for peace and prosperity. Hence the uh, songs that related and had the term peace in it, the place of quiet rest. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, uh, the body of the sermon will come from the 122nd Psalm. It's a rather short psalm. There are only nine verses in it. So uh, this is uh, where the lesson will come from. The recipe for peace and prosperity. And since it comes from the Old Testament, um, we might call it the ancient <laughs> recipe for peace and prosperity. First, let's... Uh, Let's clarify a couple of misconceptions. First of all, it's not wrong for Christians to prosper, or it's not wrong for us to desire uh, prosperity. In first and third John, uh, verse three, uh, it was John's prayer for Gaius that he prosper as long as he did not jeopardize his soul. And here's the fine line. It's okay to prosper. If we, but if we put prospering in uh, the place of, or we let it substitute uh, what is really important, and that is our relationship with the Lord, then it does become dangerous. In Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, uh, one must be very, very cautious, it says, in desiring prosperity, that it not lead him to feel that he does not need God anymore. And so first, understand that it's not wrong to want to be prosperous. Uh, the caveat here is that we can't uh, substitute prosperity for our relationship with the Lord. Uh, secondly, I believe that happiness and prosperity are not usually evaluated properly by the world. Um, the world looks uh, kind of as the, at the good life, and it, it, that the good life is, is literally impossible without being self-centered, without sensual pleasures, and even the, the TV ads uh, revolve around that. If you drink a certain beverage, that makes you cool. If you wear a certain clothing, if you have a certain shoe that you wear, all of these things make you much, much uh, better. Uh, if you're driving the right car. So in that, we uh, understand that happiness and prosperity are not evaluated by the world. The world thinks that uh, prosperity is the only thing and we can uh, search for prosperity in lieu of searching for the Lord. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 2 verses 1 through 11 where uh, Solomon uh, talks about um, uh, the, the hard way, and he says all is vanity. And remember, Solomon was a very, very rich man, but he realized that riches do not take the place of God being a part in your life. And finally, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, it says, those who live only in pleasure don't, those who live only in pleasure are dead while they are alive. And the third misconception that the world has is that faithful service to God does not automatically withhold prosperity. We don't have to be as poor as church mice. Many seem to, be, to think that uh, if we're prosperous, we must be doing something wrong. 
Uh, if we're happy and prosperous, something must be the matter with our life. We can't have it that good. And so in all the way back to Old Testament times, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18, it says God is the source of our prosperity. And uh, we understand in Daniel chapter 6, verses 25 to 28, that Daniel was certainly at a disadvantage, at no disadvantage, I'm sorry, during and after his trials. And finally, in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, Christians are to regard their prosperity as having come from the Lord and to use it in his service. And so let's get those uh, misconceptions out of the way. And so let's take a look at this ancient recipe. And if you have your Bibles handy, and I have mine right in front of me, and I have it turned to Psalm 122. And so let's look at them. And we are going to view uh, eight points this evening. First, there must be a spirit of gladness in us and an eager anticipation for the Lord's day to come when we get to go to the house of the Lord and worship. And so if we take a look at Psalm 122, verse 1, it said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. God's house today is the church. And no one can live honorably if they, if they don't have the Lord's Day worship every Lord's Day. Um, most congregations receive calls. Uh, now it's emails or texts for help from needy families. Um, and you know, that's okay. We, we can give, but needy uh, and faithful people never really need to ask. The way of the transgressor is hard. Within our number, within our congregation, we know those that have need, and we take care of those that have need over and over and over again. Why? Because they're part of our number. They are part of our church. And as a part of our church, they are very, very special. Two, true peace and prosperity requires taking a stand for God. Letting God know where you stand in relationship with him. Let's look at verse 2 of Psalm 122. It says, our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. You know, with God, there's a difference between, between being an insider and an outsider. It's not enough. It, it's not like playing horseshoes. It's not like who's closest to the pin. It's not like having a, a leaner. God expects full commitment. He wants the ringer. He wants that horseshoe to go over that peg. That's what we're supposed to be about. And Jesus was very succinct about that. He said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, he who is not with me is against me. God will not prosper anyone who is against him. Now, you might say, whoa, whoa, there's a lot of rich people out there that are not godly. But are they spiritually rich? I don't know about you, but I want to be spiritually blessed. We hear the, the, the prosper teachers on uh, TV. They're almost always on late at night. And they say, you must give a vow, you must make a vow to the Lord. And they even have the numbers down. Some, sometimes it's $68. And sometimes they say there's 300 people out there that need to fulfill a 
thousand dollar vow even if you don't have it go into debt to do it because if you give you plant and god will prosper you and i got news for those folks they're preaching dogma and they are preaching what doesn't exist let's just remember that we need to stand uh, at the gates of Jerusalem. We need to take a stand, just like Joshua did when he said, I don't know about you, but as for me and my family, we will follow the Lord. Three, unity is a prerequisite of peace and prosperity. Let's go to verse three. It says, Jerusalem that is built as a city is compact together. A divided house cannot prosper. People will drive many, many miles to go to a church where they find peace if there is contention in the church that they are attending. We need to get along with our brothers and sisters in Christ if we are hoping to have peace. We need to be workers together. We sing those songs, I want to be a worker for the Lord. We need to be workers together with a common goal, and that common goal being that we want to live with the Lord forever. And so with that common goal in, in life, unity is the, the first step that gets us there. Number four, peace and prosperity are always linked to gratitude. Let's look at verse four of Psalm 122. It says, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel, give thanks to the name of the Lord. That's gratitude. Give thanks to the name of the Lord. Every prayer that we offer to the Lord ought to have thanks in it. Give thanks in the name of the Lord. You know, I've heard an old saying uh, that goes something like this. No one has ever prospered by forgetting those that helped him along the way. We can probably name people who helped us along the way. Maybe it was a teacher in school that put us on the right path. Maybe it was a preacher. Maybe it was an elder. Maybe it was a member of the congregation that sat down and, and talked with us. And, and we talked about priorities and we talked about important things. We know that we need to give thanks in the name of the Lord. Because all that we have, we have because the Lord has blessed us that way. We can't get around that. Our blessings come from on high. James tells us all good things come from the Lord. Number five, peace and prosperity require a respect for standards of authority. The children of Israel were walking around for years and years and years. They were in captivity in Egypt. Uh, they prospered numerically to the point where they probably prospered to the tune of two to three million people. They left and miraculously, we know that the Red Sea, you know, had parted. And uh, then when they did get to the other side, Moses went up Mount Sinai and he came down with tablets and on those tablets were written commandments up until that time there was no real written authority now there was authority and if we look in uh verse five all right if we look in verse five it says for their thrones were set for judgment the thrones in the house of David. 
okay? Peace and prosperity have a respect for these thrones of judgment. Why? Because the Bible lets us know, and, and we don't follow the old law anymore, lets us know the way that we are to guide our life. You know, we sing the song that comes from a song, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's where we get what we need to follow the Lord. The, the thrones of judgment, the standards of right and wrong, we can't devise those on our own. Tried and true, um, I guess, rules, of decency and standards of decency should not be just flippantly disregarded. The sacredness of marriage, the church, law and order, respect for the aged, respect for human life, all of those revolve around a set of standards that God has put before us. Six, Peace and prosperity come as the result of prayer and of love. Let's look at verse 6 of Psalm chapter 122. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Wow. May they prosper who love you. Prosperity is related to prayer. In the model prayer that uh, Jesus gave to his disciples that we commonly know as the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. We depend upon the Lord. Peace results from prayer. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, you know, we we understand uh, uh, that those, those two wonderful verses and they finish with, and you will gain the peace that passes all understanding. All right? So uh, this peace and this love that we need in our lives are the result of prayer and we will prosper as long as love is in our life. And as long as we have a rich and powerful prayer life. Seven, the secret of peace and prosperity lies within and not without. Let's look at verse seven. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. You know, how many people have said, I, I'd be happy if I had lots more money. If I hit the lottery, I would be happy then. I know of people that hit the lottery that, that had an unhappy life rather than a happy life. I'd be happy if I was young again. I'd be happy if I had a million dollars. I would be happy if I had that person's talents. Well, guess what? You don't have that person's money. You're not young again. And you don't have anybody's talents but your own. And the Lord says to you that peace has to be within. You need to take what you have and utilize it. Take what you have and utilize it for the Lord. You know what? We, we need rather than look at others, but to do some introspection and look at ourselves and say, the Lord has blessed me with these talents. How can I do it best? What can I do with it to make it worthwhile, not just for me, but for the Lord and for the Lord's church? It comes from within. It's an inside job. It's not an outside job. And finally, in verses 8 and 9, peace and prosperity require proper relationships. 
Let's look at verse 8 and 9. It says, For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, May peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Nobody is more miserable than a person who is self-centered. When we forget about our lot in life, and that is to help one another, to come to the aid of one another, as it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, do good unto all people, especially those of the household of faith. We're told to care for the widows, to care for the orphans, to care for those that are less needy. When Jesus preached that great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, I think he knew that in many ways we would be helping one another. And we know that in the first century church, just almost immediately, almost immediately after uh, those 3,000 came to the Lord, we know that just verses uh, further, like in verse 47, it says that they were, they were uh, eating and drinking together in one another's homes. They were, they were coming together because this is what they were supposed to be doing. Peace and prosperity had to do with relationships with one another. And what we know is that rebounds in joy for everybody around us. We, we set the tone. People ought to recognize we're Christians by the good that we do. And we will prosper and we will find peace. I challenge you this evening. Go ahead and take out your Bibles. Reread Psalm 122. Take a look at those eight things that involve peace and prosperity in your life. You know, peace and prosperity starts with having exactly the right relationship with God. That means that God is in your heart through your confession that Jesus, his son, is his son. It, it comes from repenting of our old ways. It comes from being baptized for the remission of our sins. And so if you do seek true peace and prosperity, you need to be a member of God's family. So we offer that invitation at this time as the lesson comes to an end. I pray that we will uh, understand that we need to be within those compact walls. We need to be unified. We need to care for one another. But it starts with us taking that first step towards salvation. If you haven't come to the Lord yet, this is the invitation for you to do so. Just call one of us and we'll be at your beck and call. We will take you down, take your confession, and baptize you for the remission of your sins. Uh, I uh, pray that uh, this lesson has hit home and that uh, we have something that we can uh, sleep on this evening and that we can... Uh, be enriched by it. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we have. We're grateful for the time that we have with you, the time that we have uh, where we can just gather together in your name. I just pray that you would bless us, that you would be with us. I pray that you would uh, continue to uh, guide us and guide our ways. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to uh, continue to do your will. Help us to seek peace and prosperity in our lives and know that we find it within your word. Continue to bless us, continue to comfort us, and help us to comfort one another. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid off somewhere beyond the blue.